The passage that we're going to look at this morning is in chapter 5 of John, which was read already. And we're going to focus not so much on the, uh, the healing that Jesus did of the man, which was uh, an amazing story, and it's packed full of details, full of rich things to learn. But we're going to look at, really, the focus of Jesus' response to the Jews who are upset with him about doing this healing on the Sabbath. And the fact that he not only healed on the Sabbath, which they thought was against God's law, but for the fact that God, Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. They took great offense to this, and we're going to take a look at how Jesus responds to, to their offense. You see, we all have to figure out, we all have to answer the question, who's Jesus? We all in this world um, have to come to a right conclusion because if we come to a wrong conclusion of who Jesus is, it actually ends in tragedy. Now, when, when, when Jesus was born, Herod came to a conclusion of who Jesus was. And his conclusion was that Jesus was a threat to his kingdom and his life. And so he killed many of the babies. The Magi, they heard about Jesus and the conclusion that they came to was that Jesus is worthy to be worshipped, and so they brought gifts to Jesus. John, the apostle, he learned about Jesus. He came to know Jesus, and the conclusion that he came to is that I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And so the question that we have to ask today that's still relevant is, who is Jesus? And I think we all kind of, in this audience, we would all say we know who Jesus is, we've read about Jesus, but you know what? I want us to take some time to go deep because some of the things that Jesus talks about this morning are deep. And so there's a sense in which it feels safe when you're snorkeling. You can kind of put your head underwater and you've got the snorkel above and you know that the air is just right there, not really far. You can get to it really quickly. But we're going to go deeper in a sense because Jesus goes deeper. And when Jesus goes deep, he goes quick in this passage. He doesn't waste any time. And so... Um, I encourage you, if you don't have your Bible open, to open up to John chapter 5. We're going to be looking at, focusing on verses 16 to 24. And one of the things that I did in preparation for the sermon is I wanted to know what people in this world think about Jesus. And so as I went through the drive through as I went to the bank, as I, you know, talk to people here and there, I go out for a little exercise in the evenings and I talk to certain people regularly, I just said to them, hey, you know what, I'm doing a bit of a survey I'm going to be talking about Jesus soon and at my church, and I got three questions I want to ask you. Can you, would you be willing to answer these three simple questions? Quick questions, maybe not all are simple, but quick. And so the first question was, who is Jesus? Who do you understand him to be? Who do you believe him to be? And the second question is, is Jesus God? Sort of a yes or no question. And the third question is, is Jesus supposed to be worshipped and obeyed? And it was really interesting to, to hear these responses because the, the first person I did that to is actually somebody that I bought corn from. And I uh, just drove up and bought the corn, and after I paid my money, I said, can I just ask these questions? And, and the first person that I asked, he said, um, you know, I said, who is Jesus? And he said, well, he's, he's the Son of God. I'm like, okay, this is going good. Uh, the second question, is he God? Does that mean he's God, in other words? Does it mean he's deity? Yes, it does. And uh, at this point, that was, the first question, that was the first time I did this interview, and I didn't have the third question prepped yet. This came after this first conversation. And, and we got talking a little bit, and I came to realize he's a Christian. So my first little interview went really well. But um, as I went and asked different people, their, their answers were, were varied. They were quite different. Um, some said, he's the son of God. But then when it came to, who is Jesus, is he God? They're like, no. And uh, is he to be worshipped? Is he to be obeyed? Uh, lots of different answers. Um, but uh, a quick little summary of some of the answers that people gave. Who is Jesus? Some said, uh, he's also a good teacher. Uh, someone at Starbucks told me, he's the one that lives in everyone to show us how to live. I didn't have time to talk about that. I had to keep going. There's cars behind me. But that was her answer. I had somebody say, I've never really thought about that before. I don't know. Just sort of a sense of, of curiosity. And then I had somebody say, I haven't thought about it. 
In other words, I don't want to talk about it. And so there's all these different answers that, that people give. Um, what were the responses of, is he God in the flesh? Is he God? Um, some said yes, several said yes, surprisingly. Um, but several, probably most, said no. Um, and of course, a few said, I don't know, I've never thought about it, sort of implying I don't want to think about it as well, perhaps. And then the, um, oh, I want to back up a little second, I forgot one that was kind of interesting. One lady I asked, do you believe that Jesus is, who is Jesus? And her answer was, an entity. Just an entity, not even a person, not even a supreme being. And so, um, they're, they're all over the place. And, um, but the question, is Jesus to be worshipped? Is he be to be obeyed? Um, you know, most people said no. He's a good teacher, maybe. He's a son of God. Um, but even some that said he's God said, no, he's not to be worshipped and obeyed. And again, I didn't have time in these, you know, quick little conversations to engage too deeply with these people. But, but the question is still relevant today. People are confused. People are, I would say, and I say this respectfully, ignorant. They're unaware of who Jesus is. They're biblically illiterate. And so the, the question of who Jesus is is what we're going to look at and focus at. Who is he? Because it matters who he is. Because if we recognize him to be somebody other than he is, it actually has a very tragic ending. In this account that we looked at, that we read out briefly, Jesus meets this man. He's, he's paralyzed. He's been paralyzed for 38 years. Um, he can't get down to the water to get healed. Jesus has compassion on him. He has mercy on him. He extends this, this offer to heal him. Would you like to be healed? And, and the man says, yes. And so then he gets up, and Jesus says, well, pick up your mat and, and go on your way. And so he does that. And he doesn't know who this is. But then... The Pharisees, the Jews hear about this, and they become irate. They become offended at this. And so then they take issue with Jesus on this, and they meet with Jesus, and Jesus here is discussing this with him. And so it was clear in the Old Testament what God said about the Sabbath, don't work on the Sabbath. It was very simple, and it was very clear. But you know what the Jews did? They made a whole bunch of other rules to put on top of that, so that if you obey these other rules, you could fulfill the rule of the Old Testament. And so the, 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 the command of the Sabbath was very simple. Don't do your regular work routine on the Sabbath. Ta take a day off. Take a day to be rested. And so the Jews placed this heavy burden on, um, the Pharisees did on the Jews, and, and Jesus knows about this. And so they're, they're, they're upset with this, and so he addresses this with them. But in addressing this issue, Jesus doesn't just address this issue because he knows this is actually a surface issue. He goes much deeper because what he does is he begins to talk about his relationship with his father. He doesn't take them to the Old Testament and say, here, let me show you in Exodus, let me show you in the Old Testament here what it actually says. Show me where it says these other rules, because they can't. But he doesn't do that. What he says is, I'm going to talk to you about my relationship and my position with the Father. And so that's where Jesus goes very quick, very deep. And, and, and a few times he says to them, truly, truly, which is a way to say, trust me, what I'm saying is true. This is valid. I, I, what I'm speaking is honest. You might not understand this. You might not grasp the fullness of this. We can't, frankly, grasp the fullness of, of the, the deity of, of, of Christ in terms of the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the fact that there's three persons and there's one God and the Father's not the Son and the Son's not the Father and the Holy Spirit's not either of them and they're, they're all persons and they're all 100% God. That's something that if we think too hard on, we'll, you know, it, it'll, it'll short-circuit the brain a little bit, so to speak. But the reality is that's reality. And that's what Jesus brings them to in this conversation here. Let's take a look at some of these verses because it's brilliant what Jesus does. You see, when we want to explain something, we want to explain something deep, somebody writes books and books about it. But when Jesus wants to explain something deep, he just does it in a several verses. 
And this is what, one of the things I love about Jesus. He can take some of the, the, the most deep things and he explains it in the simplest possible way. He brings it right down to what we need to know and what we need to understand. It contains some of the simplest explanations of the deepest mysteries of who he is, is what Jesus is doing. In verse 16, it says this, And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. And for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. If we were to talk about the Father, if we were to, you know, we pray our Heavenly Father, we would address him as our Father. Collectively, he is he is our Father. But Jesus doesn't lower himself to the sonship of the Father on a creation level, such that we've all been created by him. In that sense, we're all sons of God, so to speak. And he doesn't lower himself to say, I'm our, he doesn't call him our Father and, and, and lower himself to the, the sonship of even being adopted into his family like you and I are. Our adoption, our ability to call him Father comes from the fact that We've been adopted by grace. And he doesn't do that. He says, my father. Now, the Jews, they often, we hear in sermons, they get this wrong, they get that wrong, they misunderstand this, they made these wrong rules and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's true. But here, when the Jews figure out, when they, do, when they come to the conclusion that Jesus says, my father means he's God, they're right. They actually get this one right. They understand correctly that what Jesus is saying is, I am God. So there's what's called, and an, there's an exclusive, distinct relationship between Jesus and the Father that doesn't exist anywhere else. And Jesus explains his relationship here with them. Look at what it says. He says, my Father is working until now. That's kind of an odd way to say it, frankly, because we would normally say, well, my father has been, right? My father has been a plumber for several years, and he is still a plumber, right? He has been, past tense. But Jesus says, my father is working. He puts it in the present tense, until now. And so he's, he's, he's alluding to the fact that the father is eternal. My father, who he has an exclusive relationship with, is eternal. And then he adds this, and I myself, am working. Not, I have been working with the Father, or the Father has been working, and I was working with the Father, we've had a great relationship, blah, 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 but my Father is working, and I am working. He's speaking of the eternality of God the Father, and he says, just as God the Father is eternal, I also am eternal. And that's what the Jews get. That's what they understand. And that what gets under the skin, because if he is God, they have to contend with him, don't they? Let's take a look at claim number two. Verses 19. It says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing from himself unless it is something that he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in the same manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all these things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. So the first point that I forgot to mention is the fact that Jesus is equal to the Father in personhood. Jesus is equal to the Father in person. They are on the, the same level, so to speak. You know, if you were to go into, a, um, into a, a, a coffee shop and talk to, you see four people sitting around a table, and you say, um, you know, hey, how are you doing? Uh, what have you guys, how's your week been? And, and, th and one of the guys says, yeah, well, I did three brain surgeries this week. You're like, whoa, these are, these are brain surgeons. 
right? And the other guy says, yeah, I did four. And the other guy says, well, I did five. And they're sort of outing, you know, upping each other. And then the other guy says, um, and then I say, the other guy doesn't speak up. And so I say to the other guy, well, you know, how many did you do? He's like, well, I'm the nurse. <laughs> and, and, and you quickly realize you got three guys at one level and one guy that's at a totally different level. And in a sense, that's what Jesus is proclaiming here. He's saying, I'm at the level of the Father. There's that level where we're eternal and, and, and you're not. And so, so the first one is the fact that Jesus is equal to God in personhood. The second one is the fact that Jesus is equal to God in works. And so he says here um, that his works are the same as the Father. They are the same. They're not different necessarily. Um, In fact, he says, again, I point out here in verse 19, he says, truly, truly. He understands two things. Jesus understands, first of all, that they are um, rebelliously unbelieving. They're stubbornly unbelieving. But he also recognizes that this is a very difficult concept to grasp. And so that's why he says, truly, truly. What I'm saying to you is accurate. You can, you can accept this as true from God. You see, Jesus is saying that the works that he does are, are based on what he sees the Father doing. He and the Father are one, and they always work in perfect harmony. They never contradict or undermine one another. They're always working in parallel, so to speak. They're always in full agreement, and, and the Son does nothing apart from the Father. You see, Jesus doesn't have one agenda, and the Father has a separate agenda. They always have the same agenda, and there are never issues that come up where they have to negotiate or they have to give and take or they have to call the Holy Spirit to mediate. There's nothing like that that ever goes on. And so um, I like what one commentator wrote. He said, the son, from his very nature and relation to the father, can do nothing independently or separately from the father. And Jesus showed that also at the, the time when he was tempted out in the desert. He doesn't act separately from what the father does. Though they are each distinct persons in the Godhead, they are actually one in essence, and they always have the same purpose in mind. When Jesus tells this to him, he's saying that they don't just actually have a disagreement with him, right? The Jews are, are, are persecuting him. He's saying, you don't have just a disagreement with me because I do what I see my father doing. And if you have a disagreement with we, me and with what I'm doing, look to the father because I'm doing what, he, what I see him doing. We, um, <laughs> we as little kids, sometimes we get in the park and uh, there's a bully, somebody who, who mistreats us and we say to them, yeah, I'm going to go get my dad. He's bigger than you. He's, he's going to you know, fix this situation. You watch out. You know, I don't care how big dad your dad is, my dad's bigger. And <laughs> but this is not what Jesus is doing. He's not calling sort of on the father to back him up. He's calling on the father in a sense, bringing him up in this to say, I'm equal with the father. For what he does, I do as well. And so when the Father shows mercy on the Sabbath, Jesus here shows mercy on the Sabbath by healing this man. When the Father confronts the rules, man-made Sabbath rules or any other man-made rules that su supersede God's rules, Jesus confronts those people with those man-made rules. When the Father draws people to Jesus, when that's what the Father is doing, Jesus speaks and that's accomplished. And so he's doing what he sees his father doing. I appreciate what Augustine said about the relationship between the father and the son. He says this, Our Lord does not say, Whatsoever the father doeth, the son doeth other things like them, but the very same things. If the son doeth the same things, and in like manner, then let the Jew be silenced the Christian believe, and the heretic be convinced. The Son is equal to the Father. Turn over with me, though, in John to chapter 14, if you would. Because Jesus, John, brings us to another conversation that Jesus had, and Jesus explains further, and he elaborates on his relationship 
with the Father. In John chapter 14, verse 9 to 11, Philip asks Jesus if he could see the Father. And Jesus, in verse 9, said to him, Have I been with you all so long, and have you not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak for myself, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. You see, the Jews should have noticed that when they see Jesus, when they were interacting with Jesus, they were seeing the Father. You can't separate them. Although they are two distinct persons in the triune God, Jesus says actually in John 10, I and my Father are one. They are one in essence, one in purpose. Over and over in the book of John, Jesus tells them that he is one with the Father. So if, if what Jesus is claiming doesn't already offend the Jews enough, his statement about the love that the Father has for him might add insult to injury. If we slip back in John chapter 5, take a look at what Jesus says in verse 20. He says, For the love, sorry, for the Father loves the Son. The Jews are upset with what he's doing, and here Jesus says, the Father loves the Son. The Father loves me. What I'm doing, I see my Father doing, and he loves me, and he loves what I'm doing. So the Jews, they think that Jesus is is breaking the law, offending God, that he's guilty, that he's breaking relationship with the Father, and Jesus says, I'm in relationship with the Father. I'm in a loving relationship with I'm in the sphere of his love. I am abiding in his love. For these are the things that are within the purview, so to speak, of what he wants us to do in love. And so he doesn't just sort of tell them the facts, but he says, you know what? This is a loving relationship. The approval of the Father is upon me. And if you go back to his baptism, we can know what what the Father also says. This is my son in whom I am well what? Pleased, right? So there's the pleasure of the Father, there's the approval of the Father on Jesus, and and Jesus is pointing this out to the Jews who are irate about the fact that he's doing this and now claiming this. Jesus is basically saying, you question what I'm doing, but trust me when I say that I'm doing what I see my Father doing. I have been sent by the Father, and I'm not acting outside of what he wants me to do. I'm under the very umbrella, so to speak, of exactly what he wants me to do. In other words, I'm abiding in him. And we also are called to abide in him, are we not? To sort of be under that umbrella of doing what he wants, what's important to him, um, what's right, what's righteous. That's, That's part of abiding in him. So we now see that Jesus is equal to God also in works. First, equal in person. Second, equal in works. And the next one in verse 21, we're going to see that Jesus is equal to God in power. Verse 21 says this, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, who created life? God did. Even the Jews would say that. In the Old Testament, when the prophets were called at times to bring somebody back from the dead, who gave them life? It was God. And who decided that it was time to give that person life? It was God. It wasn't the prophet. It wasn't the prophet's will. It wasn't the prophet's decision to give that person life, but it was God through the prophet. But Jesus says here something very interesting. He says, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, he's saying, I have the power to make life, I have the power to give life, and I have the power to raise the dead to life. And then he adds at the end, or he, he concludes at the end of that statement, 
that he can do it as he wishes. In other words, just as the Father can do that as he wishes, he too can do that as he wishes because his will is always in line with the Father. It never deviates from that. And so as the Father wishes something, the Son also wishes it, and it doesn't contradict. But the question is, what death and life is Jesus speaking about here? He says, for the Father raises the dead and gives them life. Does that mean the people that are in the cemetery down the street that you may drive by occasionally? Or does that mean the spiritual deadness that everybody's born into? Well, I believe it's both. And here's why. If you turn over to verse 25, Jesus says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And going down to verse 28, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. You see, one day Jesus is gonna be the one that calls for everybody and everybody will attend to his call at the great resurrection. Everybody who is dead will be reunited with their body. I've preached on that once before. And, and, and that's going to be a great and glorious day where he's going to immortalize every single body and unite every single soul to their body with an immortal body that's going to be glorified and fit for heaven or hell. An eternal fitness. In other words, um, able to endure um, the eternity in both locations. Um, and so Jesus also, though, raises the spiritually dead. And I want to talk about that for a moment because we are spoken of as being spiritually dead. And, and the question that I have is, what does it mean to be spiritually dead? If the Bible talks about this, we need to know what it means because Jesus says he raises the dead. He raises the, the, us spiritually from our deadness and he will one day at the end at the great resurrection. But the reality is that our spiritual deadness um, is, is, a, is a way to say that we are utterly helpless to accomplish our own salvation. Jesus speaks of us as being spiritually dead to convey that idea that we are utterly helpless to do that. So let's look for a moment at what it means to be spiritually dead. Because in our spiritual deadness, we are actually a lot of things that are very humbling to admit and confess to. Note, as we go through this list, how depraved and helpless we are to, to actually save ourselves. We are crooked by our nature. By our very nature, we are crooked. And we can't straighten ourselves out. We are corrupt through and through, and we are actually unable to remove that corruption or that stain on our cloth, so to speak. The Bible says that we are eternally in debt to God for the transgressions that we've committed against him and his laws. The Bible says that we are prideful, prideful in thinking that we are good enough to get to heaven and that there's at least some other way maybe besides Jesus where we can appease God. We are dead in the fact that we are blind to the truth. We are born into this. This is what we were born into. Blind to the truth that the narrow path of Christ is the only path to salvation and that this broad path actually leads to destruction. Being spiritually dead means that we are also lost without a shepherd. We are lost. It sounds kind of silly to say, but it's sort of like being like the child without a parent. What's a child without a parent to lead and guide them and show them and teach them and love them and care for them and instruct them so that they can live? In our spiritual deadness, we don't have a shepherd. We look to each other, we look to the moon, we look to the trees, we look to all sorts of other ridiculous things to be our shepherd. But Jesus says, I am the shepherd. In our spiritual deadness, we suppress the truth. We say, no, I don't want to accept that. I don't want that to be true. We, we adopt this relativism that says, I can believe what I want, you believe what you want, and let's all make our own truths, and, and hopefully this works out. In our spiritual deadness, we're actually darkened in our understanding. It's like you're in a room and your eyes are closed and you're trying to figure out where the door is or where the escape is or where to get to safety. We're darkened. 
We don't see clearly. It's like a fog. The Bible also says in our spiritual deadness, we are alienated. That means we are separated. There's, a, there's an alienation, a separation. We're totally different. One's righteous, one's wicked, one's evil. One's light, one's called darkness. Our deadness also means that we are fools. The Bible says that apart from Christ, apart from confessing him, apart from his, from believing in him, we are fools. The Bible says that we are also deceived. We think we know the way, but we don't. The Bible also calls us slaves to sin. In our deadness, part of that is we are slaves to sin. We don't really grieve over our sin. We just follow after it. It gives us certain weird pleasures. Weird in the sense that it does, doesn't agree with God. And lastly in my list here is the fact that it means that we are condemned. That's a big, strong word. But we're condemned. Underneath all of that, in that deadness, that's the position that we're in. So this is all what it means to be spiritually dead. What hope, there, it, what hope is there for a person in that condition, I ask you? How is it possible for those who are in that kind of a condition, how is it possible for these things all to be reversed? Who can rescue us from the depravity and darkness? Is anybody so brilliant or wise that they can make a plan to save us from the pit and the judgment that is to come? Well, Jesus actually answers that in verse 24. We're going to get to the good news in a little bit here. But um, the Jesus, what he's saying here, and again, I want to read the verse is, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he wishes. For us, we were born in that state of spiritual deadness as I just talked about, but Jesus says he is life. He's the one that can reverse that. He's the only one. And so we can see here that um, Jesus is equal to God in power. That's the third point. If his claims are not enough, he continues actually by telling them another way that he's equal to the Father, and that is the fact that he is the judge of mankind. In verse 22, it says this, <coughs> For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. So here's the Jews. They're upset with Jesus. They're t they're, they're, they're they're taking him uh, to the task of, of defending why he's doing what he's doing, and Jesus is explaining how he's equal to God in person, how he's equal to God in, in power, how he's equal to God in works, and now Jesus says, I'm equal to God in the fact that I'm the one that's going to judge humanity. So here these guys are, and if they're connecting the dots, they're like, okay, I need to stand before this guy one day in judgment. Right now, he's judging their words, their actions, and by his grace, he's saying, I judge you, and, I, and, and listen to me, pay attention, truly, truly, because if you get what I'm saying, you'll understand that I'm God, and you have to, you have to contend with me. And so, I'm not sure if they grasp this, but he's saying that he's the judge. And so, um, there are several verses that, that talk about this. Um, let me just point out, first of all, that we are not judged by angels, we are not judged by prophets, we are not judged by apostles, but we are judged by God himself being Jesus Christ. When Jesus came the first time, he came with mercy, he came with grace, he came to extend that hand of mercy, didn't he? But when he comes again, it's gonna be with judgment, and it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The Father has handed over all judgment to the Son because God and Je because Jesus is both God and human. 
Father has handed him over um, the judgment as an exclusive honor and responsibility. You see, the one who died for sinners will judge the sinners. The one who died for humanity, so to speak, will judge humanity. Acts 17, 30 to 31 says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now commanding men that everyone everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he determined, having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead. The evidence that he is the judge has already been proven in his resurrection. If the Jews were getting this, they needed to repent. But Jesus gives one more way that he's equal to the Father, and that's connected to him in being the judge. Verse 22 here says, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that... All will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You see, the Father and the Son are equal, and they deserve equal honor. Unfortunately, some say that Jesus is merely a mortal man, or maybe at best a prophet, perhaps the best prophet that's ever lived, But unless we honor the Son as we honor the Father, we are actually guilty of not honoring the Father. We can't honestly honor one without the other. If we do, it's incomplete, and it's actually unacceptable worship. Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the truth is, as Jesus is outlining here, that the Father and the Son deserve equal honor. Jesus does not receive sub-honor, lesser honor, some honor, extra honor that's left over after the Father's done with getting his honor. It's equal honor because Jesus is God. That's the only way that he could say this. No one can truly honor the Father unless they also honor the Son in the same way. That is by honoring him as God. Let me repeat that. No one can truly honor the Father unless they also honor the Son in the same way as God. You see, the Son is not inferior to the Father, but he's equal to the Father in dignity and honor. And he is to be worshipped with equal honor and equal worship. Even in Hebrews 1.8, the Father says this of the Son. Listen to this. And let all the angels of God worship him. That's what the Father said of the Son. Let all the angels of God worship him. It's only fitting for Jesus to be honored equal to the Father since he's equal to God in person, works, and power, and judgment. But let's turn to Philippians because it talks about this a little bit as well. In Philippians chapter 2, this is a passage you've, you've read many times probably Philippians chapter 2 speaks of the honor that Jesus deserves. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess. Confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord. And then get this next statement that follows. So every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It gives God the Father glory when we worship Christ. If we don't worship Christ, we're not giving the Father glory. You can't worship one without the other because it's just not possible. You'll always lose, if I may use that expression, if you worship one, but you cast aside the other. 
So those are the five claims. The fact that Jesus is equal to God in person, Jesus is equal in works, he's equal in power, he's equal in judgment, and he's equal in honor. But then let's go back to John chapter 5, because then Jesus here cuts to the quick. There always ought to be in a message a so what, okay? There's a, an element of, okay, I've got this knowledge, I've got this understanding, I know who Jesus is now, this is hard to comprehend or hard to fathom, but this is reality. But then Jesus, knowing who he's talking to, these hard-hearted um, Jews, this is what he says in verse 24. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word, in other words, what I've just been telling you, and all the other things, and believes him who sent me, again, he's pointing back to the Father. That's what he's doing this whole time, back to the Father. I've got a relationship with my Father that's exclusive, and that's, that's um, exclusive, and my position with him is equal. And so he's pointing them back there, and he says, um, he who believes in me and has sent me, sorry, has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. He's saying, you guys are in death. This is not our father. This is my father. You can't even call him your father because you don't put faith in me. They haven't not been um, trusting and, and following God necessarily. And so he's here gives them the gospel. He says, if you, if you believe in me, and you believe in the Father who sent me, you're going to have eternal life. And you won't come into judgment, but you will pass out of death into life. So he ends, in a sense, this little passage. He keeps talking in the rest of the chapter. Honestly, I encourage you to read the rest of the chapter because he's got so many deep things um, to, to, to say about who he is in relationship to the Father and his position with the Father. Um, read the rest of it this afternoon. Please do. Um, but here he gives the gospel message, and it's very simple. Come to me for life. I'm the one that has eternal life, and if you come to me, I will take you from death to life. Friends, it couldn't be more clear. It's deep. I get it. It's, it's hard to understand. We're all in the same boat, but it's clear. Jesus is God. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. There's no other way to the Father except by giving him honor, believing in him, submitting to him, and confessing him Lord. And that's the call that I give to you. If you're not a believer, come to the Lord Jesus. He will save you. If you've heard about Jesus lots and you've never put faith in him, this is the call that Jesus gives to you. And yet probably for most of us, we love the Lord Jesus. And the call here is let's worship him. Let's praise him. Let's extol him. Let's, let's do what he calls for us to do. And let's enjoy the fact and revel in the fact that we have eternal life through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you and we worship you for you sent your only eternal begotten Son to be humbled and to be living here on this earth for some 30, 33 years, to be mocked, to be ridiculed, to be spat on, to be beaten, to be despised, and to go to the cross that we might have eternal life. We thank you that it was your son that you sent. It wasn't a mere prophet. It wasn't some other being, but it was your son, who is and has eternal life. I pray, Father, that we would grow in our worship of you. I pray that we would give, give you and give Jesus the honor that he and you deserve. Father, we've talked today about, the, about you. We've talked about the son. We haven't really talked um, about the Holy Spirit, but likewise, we praise and worship the Holy Spirit for there are three persons in the one true God. And I pray, Father, that we would, um, we would grow in our love for you all the more. And that, Lord, when we talk about our Lord Jesus, that we would proclaim his deity, that we would give the full scope of who he is, for he is great and he is mighty. He is the one that made the world, 
And he is the one that makes us new. And he is the one that forgives us of our sins. He is the one that is our hope. In Christ's name we pray.